Hello, TPC family. It's going to be such a great worship service right here at Turning Point Church. Yes, it is, and we are so glad you've chosen to join us here online today. And even though we're not together in person, we are joined by the Spirit of God. Yes, we are, and together we can worship Jesus, honor God, and continue to grow in His grace. So right now, whatever you're doing, just stop for the next few minutes and join us as we worship Jesus. Hey, TPC family, let's stand to our feet and find your spot wherever you are, and let's just worship our King Jesus together. Right now, wherever you are, 
Just lift up your hands and give him praise. Just tell him thank you. Lord, we're so grateful for you. We're so thankful for you. And no matter what's going on around us, our eyes are fixed on you. So Lord, just come and meet us right now. Come and meet us wherever we are. Sing this out.
Your perfect love is casting a fear. Oh, yeah. 
spend some time in the worship of God, even in the middle of all these challenges. You know, and it's, it's challenging in times like these that people need to hear the message of the gospel. As we move into the giving portion of our service, we wanted to say thank you for your continued support and faithfulness in your tithes and offerings. You know, together, we're sharing the truth of the word of God to people who are looking for hope right here, right now, in the middle of all these challenges and crises, whether they're their personal ones or this global crisis going on right now, we definitely need the truth of the word of God. We do. So would you join me as I read the tithe verse? Then all the leaders and all the people rejoiced, brought their contributions and put them into the chest until all had given. And here's a principle that goes with it. When God's people were rebuilding the destroyed temple, it says all the leaders and all the people experienced great joy as they brought their contributions. And that in the end, all had given. God's word ties joy with giving to God's word. There are three ways that you can give here at TPC. You can give online at tpcfamily.org slash give. You can text the word give to 817-617-4378, or you can mail it to Turning Point Church, 10,700 Old Burleson Road. That's in Fort Worth, Texas, 76140. So would you join us as we pray over the offering? Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we're just so grateful just for who you are. And Lord, we're so grateful in the midst of crisis and challenge, we have a God who is sovereign over all things. So today, Father, we turn to you. We cast our cares upon you. And Father, we ask you, Lord, to intervene on our behalf. And Lord, we trust in you. Yes. And that's why today, Father, we sow this seed into the good ground of your kingdom so that multitudes would be healed, saved, and delivered in Jesus' in name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. At the end of the service today, we are offering a special time of live online prayer. So make sure you keep watching after the message today to learn how we can connect and pray together. Now, grab your Bible and get ready for a great message from the Word of God. Good evening, TPC family, and welcome to week two of the Kingdom Reconciliation uh, message series. Last week, uh, week one, we talked about the uh, the dangers of the political worldview. This week, I want to talk about the the blessing or the benefits of the Kingdom worldview. Uh, you know, right now we're in a just golly, we're in such a, um, a unique, if you will, time here in our country. We've got so many things going on. And right now, we need a church that is on the leading edge, on the forefront of, of leading our culture. And, and it's, it's especially needed in the area of racial reconciliation and reconciliation in general. Um, we should be on the forefront. We should be leading. We should be um, the ones out in front. But unfortunately, we're not. 
<clears throat> so that's what this, this series is about uh, in the context of kingdom reconciliation is, is discussing uh, what we did last week, uh, why well, one of the reasons we're not leading in the area of racial reconciliation, reconciliation in general. And then this week, what we should be doing in order to be leaders, to be out in, in the forefront of this and getting ahead of it. So uh, what I want to do is I want to contrast what we looked at last week, the, the three dangers of the political worldview, uh, with the three keys to the kingdom worldview. So let me, let me begin with our text which is out of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 21. There's a couple of verses here that I'm sure you're very familiar with, but it, I want to give it a larger context than just those couple of verses. So let me read here, starting in verse 17. Uh, if you've got your Bible there with you at home, uh, join me in this, and I, I'm reading from the New King James Version. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed. Behold, all things have become new. Now, all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though through God, were, as though God through us were pleading we implore you, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him, in Christ. So as you see here in this verse, the Lord says, we, we have become ministers of reconciliation. We need to be the leaders of reconciliation in this world, in our in, in our in our in our world, in our country, in our state, in our cities, in our community, in our in our church, and in our families, because uh, reconciliation is needed across the board, um, and it's especially needed in inside the church, uh, as well as outside of the church. So let's pray and let's let's uh, ask the Lord to continue to give us wisdom on how we can be ministers of reconciliation. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for, for the opportunity to be reconciled to you. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you not only gave us the ability to be reconciled, Lord, you have shown us the, the pattern for reconciliation. You've shown us how we can be leaders in reconciliation. And Lord, you have called us to be ministers of reconciliation. So tonight, Father, I, I pray that you would give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you and your ways and your purposes and your will in reconciliation in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so let's let's get started. Uh, I want to do a, a quick recap of last week, uh, just those three particular dangers of the political worldview that has uh, infiltrated the church and then uh, we're going to go and we're going to contrast that in the context of the kingdom worldview. So if you haven't had a chance to look at last week's message, I highly recommend that you go back uh, either on Facebook or uh, on our website into our archives. You'll be able to find it there uh, in, in the Kingdom Reconciliation Part 1, The Three Dangers of the Political Worldview. Because uh, I, I go in depth on all three of these. I'm just going to touch on them real quick here, and then contrast them with the, the kingdom worldview. So let's, let's look at the three dangers of the political worldview. Number one, the political worldview teaches that anyone who disagrees with us or refuses to believe our ideology is our enemy. Uh, man, that's a big one. That's right off the bat. We're, we're, we're in danger right there. Uh, so that's number one. Number two, compromise is viewed as a tactic of our enemy to get us to buy into their lies. And then number three, the political worldview promotes the belief that winning only comes through the defeat of our enemies. And if defeat cannot be achieved through debate, then character assassination is an acceptable strategy. So this week, I want to take those three dangers and contrast them with the three keys to the kingdom worldview in the context of reconciliation. <clears throat> and, you know, as I said a few minutes ago, 
we're in desperate need of, of leaders in this country because we're in such a unique situation. You know, we've got the pandemic going on, we've got, got uh, racial issues uh, taking place, um, we've got a, a, a hypercharged political environment. We're in a political uh, year or a, um, an election year. Uh, it's probably going to be one of the most divisive election years uh, in the history of our country. And so we've got just all this stuff going on, you know, uh, mask orders and shutdown orders and all that. It's just chaos at the moment. And it's real easy in the midst of all this chaos to, to forget that we're supposed to be leaders. Uh, unfortunately, in the church, um, one of the byproducts of that, that political worldview that we've adopted, you know, many, many church leaders and many Christians have adopted this political worldview. And one of the byproducts of that is a victim mentality. You know, we look at all that, all the stuff that's going on and all the, um, the chaos and, and, and all the, the uncertainty, and we, 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 we look at it as if we, we're victims. You know, we don't have control to fix anything, so we just kind of have this mentality, well, we just need to hunker down and, and hope Jesus comes back really quick. Um, that's, that's not a biblical mindset. Uh, you know, when, when Peter confessed Christ as the Messiah, Jesus turned to him and said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That is, that is not a church that's hunkering in the corner waiting for Jesus. That is a church that is on the forefront, that is on the front lines, that is leading, that is not, not um, afraid of what the enemy is doing, but is, is actively fighting against what the enemy is doing. It is not giving up ground to the enemy, but is taking ground from the enemy. So what is it going to take for us to get back to that mentality, that victor mentality that we should have in the gospel? I mean, that's what the gospel does. It, it takes out that victim mentality and replaces it with a victor mentality. Well, you know, as I said uh, a minute ago, the political worldview, one of the byproducts of the political worldview, is a victim mentality. And, you know, the political worldview is not something new. It's been around for millennia. You know, we see the Sadducees and the Pharisees in Jesus' day had a political worldview. In fact, it was the political worldview that even made the crucifixion of Jesus possible. Um, and, you know, the, the irony of that statement is the very thing, the very cultural uh, worldview that made Jesus' crucifixion possible is the very worldview that we're adopting in the church. Um, We've got to be very careful about this. But the flip side is, the kingdom worldview is the very thing that Jesus had which set him up to overcome the political worldview and overcome the crucifixion, to have victory over hell, death, and the grave. Uh, those, those are the things that we need as a church. Those are the, the, that's the worldview we need to have and the mentality we need in this season that we're in right now. You know, the, the old... Um, the verse out of uh, um, Esther, you know, we've been brought to the kingdom for such a time as this, and we have. Uh, we are placed here on earth at this time, in this moment, to be ambassadors for Jesus, to be ministers of reconciliation. Uh, Jesus didn't put us here to be victims. He put us here to enforce the victory of the gospel. And that's the kingdom worldview, and that's what Jesus had. Um, despite the the, um, the apparent victory of the political worldview through the crucifixion because Jesus had a kingdom worldview uh, and trusted God the Father. Of course, Jesus was God, but he humbled himself and he trusted God the Father <clears throat> in a way he wants us to trust God the Father. He was able to overcome the, the evil outcome of the political worldview, the, the destruction of the crucifixion by by raising from the dead, he overcame the crucifixion through resurrection and defeated hell, death, and the grave. And that victory is ours as well. We can experience that today. So if the kingdom worldview led to Jesus' resurrection, it can certainly lead us 
to racial reconciliation and reconciliation in general. So that's what I want to focus on tonight is the kingdom worldview. Specifically, there's three keys that I want to talk about uh, in regards to the kingdom worldview uh, in regards to uh, reconciliation. So here, here's those three keys. And these, these are contrasts to the political worldview. And I'll identify those contrasts as I go through each of these keys. But here's, here are the three keys. Number one, in order to be ministers of reconciliation, we must recognize who the real enemy is. Uh, the political worldview identifies the wrong enemy, but the kingdom worldview identifies the correct enemy. So that's number one. We have to identify who the real enemy is. Number two, uh, kingdom reconciliation is initiated by those whose hearts are right with God. And then number three, the kingdom worldview teaches that true victory comes when we are reconciled to God and each other. So let's begin by going through each of these three and contrasting uh, each one with the corresponding three in the, the political worldview. So that first one, number one, uh, of the three keys to the kingdom worldview in the context of reconciliation. In order to be ministers of reconciliation, we must recognize who the real enemy is. Now, the flip side of that corner, the opposite of that in the political worldview, is the political worldview teaches that anyone who disagrees with us or refuses to believe our ideology is our enemy. And, I mean, right off the bat there in, in the political worldview, we are immediately cutting ourselves off from the ability for reconciliation. Because the second I identify somebody else as my enemy, the last thing I want to do is be reconciled to them. Um, and, and that's that's what the political worldview teaches. Uh, it teaches the lie that another person is my enemy, and that's true, that's that's what it is. It is a lie, and if we believe that lie, we have closed the door to any hope of reconciliation, especially racial reconciliation. And, and we see that today in our culture uh, here in the United States. Is you know we take these political positions. And we immediately view somebody who has a different position as our enemy. And there's no way reconciliation can happen. Uh, and that's just the, the nature of the political worldview is it in and of itself cannot lead to reconciliation. Now, I'm not saying politics is, is evil or the politician or all politicians are evil or, or anything like that. Uh, and I'm not saying we as Christians shouldn't be involved in the political arena. But what I am saying is that if, as Christians, we do engage in the political process, which we need to, uh, and, and we do maybe get more involved in the political arena, which some, some people are called to do, we have to, be make, we have to be very careful that we make sure that we bring the kingdom worldview into the political arena. We don't allow the political arena to bring into us the political worldview, which unfortunately is what has happened. So when it comes to the aspect of who our enemy is, political worldview says it's other people, but the kingdom worldview identifies the real enemy. And there, there's only one enemy and he's the one that's been defeated by Jesus. And the, that enemy is the devil. The, Satan is our, is our one enemy. Um, Paul clearly identifies that our enemy is not other people. In Ephesians 6, uh, verse 12, he says, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and hosts of wickedness in the heavenly realms. Uh, and if you're familiar with uh, Ephesians chapter 6, you know, he's talking about spiritual warfare. He goes into the armor of God. Uh, in the ability to stand firm uh, in the day of evil, well, he identifies that our enemy is not another person. The political worldview does just the opposite. It says it is another person. Uh, but another person is not our enemy. You know, it says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Well, if God viewed the world as his enemy, there's no way he's going to give up his only begotten son in order that the world might be reconciled. <clears throat> so if we're going to have the heart of God, we cannot view other people as our enemies. We have to view the enemy as the enemy. 
There's a great pattern in the Old Testament in Joshua chapter 6 that really helps uh, flesh out this idea of identifying the proper enemy and why it's important to identify the proper enemy. If you're familiar with um, the story of Jericho in Joshua chapter 6, you know, here's the Israelites. Joshua's led them across the Jordan River. Uh, you know, they've spent 40 years in the wilderness and, and Moses dies. Joshua becomes a leader, leads them into the promised land. And here's the very first battle. This is the very first battle in the promised land that God promised to give them. So this battle sets the tone for all other battles. And God gives Israel and gives Joshua the battle plan, the pattern by which he is going to deliver the promised land into their hands. So we see right off the bat that um, the Lord, his battle plan is focused on the spiritual, not the natural. What do I mean by that? Well, we read a couple chapters earlier in, in the story of Rahab and the spies that uh, when the spies go into Jericho, kind of see what's going on and spy it out, they stay with Rahab the prostitute. And Rahab, you know, of course, conceals the spies, and, and the Lord blesses her for that uh, in many different ways. Um, but she tells the spies that, hey, look, we know who you are. We know who Israel is, and we know what God has done for you, and we are petrified because of you. They heard of all the great things God, things that God had done for Israel, and it scared them to death. And in the beginning of chapter 6, it says that Jericho had fortified the walls because of Israel, because they knew who Israel was, because they knew who Israel's God was. They fortified the walls. Now, they're fortifying the natural walls against Israel's natural ability to fight because, of course, you know, the Jericho, they're looking at things only from a natural perspective. But God looks at things from a spiritual perspective. And here's the thing, for especially for Christians, um, everything is spiritual. And for, for victory to be manifest in the natural, it has to first be enforced in the spiritual. Now, on this side of, of the, the cross, we know, we're, we know the full story of the gospel, you know, and Jesus' victory over the enemy uh, through, through his resurrection. <clears throat> we already have victory over the enemy because of Jesus. But one of the things that we're called to do is to not earn a victory over the enemy, but to enforce a victory over the enemy. And this is what we see at Jericho, where the Lord instructs Joshua and the Israelites to first battle in the spiritual before the natural. And this is a pattern that, that even applies today in the New Testament. That's what Paul talks about in, in Ephesians 6, is spiritual warfare. <clears throat> because in order for something to be manifest in the natural, it first has to occur in the spiritual. That's the order of all things, spiritual to natural. We see that in the book of Genesis in, in the creation that everything was spiritual first, and then God spoke out of the spiritual, and the natural was manifest. You know, God said, let there be light, and there was light, you know, and he called things that forth that be not as though they were, and they became from the spiritual to the natural. So everything, everything has a spiritual foundation. So in order for victory to be enforced in the natural, it first has to be enforced in the spiritual. This is what we see with, with Jericho, where... God instructs the Israelites not to go beat on the walls, not to go try and tear the walls down, but to march around the city seven times for seven days, and on the seventh day to shout. And they're, they're led by the praise singers and, and, and the, the musicians and, and the worshipers <clears throat> to fight in the, in the spiritual first in order for things to be manifest in the natural. Well, that's a pattern for us. You see that in Jesus' example. You know, Jesus didn't try and fight the Sadducees and the Pharisees. He didn't try and fight Rome in, in the natural. He did fight them in the spiritual, and he won. And he, he earned the greatest victory in the history of the world that is still being manifest to this very day. 2,000 plus years later, we see the ripple effects 
of a spiritual victory by Jesus. So in the context of, of reconciliation, uh, the political worldview wants us to believe that another person or the natural side of things is where we need to fight. And that's a deception. That, that's a distraction. The kingdom worldview teaches us that we have to fight first in the spiritual. So when it comes to somebody we're in conflict with, or when it comes to some situation where I need to be reconciled to, to another person, or a, a group of people need to be reconciled to another group of people, we have to be careful that we don't go to war with people. We have to go to war for people. What does that mean? Well, that means I, as a spiritual person, I, as a Christian, recognize that in a conflict situation, that the other person is not my enemy. That the enemy is the enemy. And the only way that reconciliation can take place between me and another person is if the enemy is defeated. Now, obviously, Jesus has already defeated the enemy, but I'm responsible for enforcing that victory in this context where reconciliation needs to occur. How do I do that? I do that by focusing on the real enemy. Well, and we need wisdom, obviously, from the Lord in each unique situation and context, but it is something that always occurs in the spiritual first. Victory comes from the spirit and then manifests in the natural. So obviously prayer is always always a, a starting point. Uh, you, we pray for that person uh, on behalf of them against the enemy. Uh, not, not, we're not praying to God to defeat this person. We're praying to God for help us to enforce the victory of the, of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the context of this relationship to bring about reconciliation. So we go to war for that person against the enemy. Uh, and there's, there's many ways this can happen. There's many forms that this can take place. But uh, I want to point one out <clears throat> here in, in the book of Isaiah. Uh, and we have to be careful that we don't get um, religiously minded. And here's what I mean. And I'm going to give you an example of this in, in Isaiah, where we just go through religious rituals thinking that spiritual warfare <clears throat> because a, re a religious ritual without a, a true heart that has been transformed is just an empty ritual. And here's a perfect example of that here in, in the book of Isaiah. I'm in Isaiah chapter 1, uh, starting in verse 12. Now this is the Lord speaking through Isaiah to his people. <clears throat> and he calls them out for their religious activities, for their religious rituals. Now, these are things that the Lord had told them to do through Moses and the prophets and, and, and the leaders. <clears throat> so they're doing the right thing. They're just not doing it for the right reason. So listen to the Lord when he speaks to Israel. Now, this Again, this is uh, starting in verse 12. When you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? Bring no more futile uh, sacrifices Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary of hearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. I'm going to stop there at verse 15 real quick. <clears throat> so here's the Lord telling Israel, yeah, you're doing all the right religious rituals, but you're, you're not doing, doing them with the right heart. You're not doing them with my heart, with, with, with the intention that I gave them to you in the first place. And in the church, again, we need to be very careful that we don't view spiritual warfare as a ritual. It's not a ritual. Spiritual warfare is, is a, a manifestation of the gospel of Jesus Christ through a heart that is set right with God and has a desire for the victory of Jesus 
to be manifest, not just only in our lives, but in the lives of other people. So if I'm in conflict with somebody and I view them as my enemy, I can do the religious rituals and, and you know, and, and go through the motions. But if my heart is really not right with this person in the sense of I have a desire to see true reconciliation, to see a, a, a rightness and a righteousness be manifest between the two of us, and I have a desire to see this person um, uh, and, and seek their good, then I'm not doing the, the I could do all the religious things, but I'm not doing it from a right heart. And here in Isaiah uh, chapter one, the Lord calls Israel out for doing the right things the wrong way, for the wrong reason. So he goes on here in, in verse 16, and he kind of, he, he contrasts that with, okay, Instead of all this religious stuff, here's what I really want from you. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Put away the evil doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. So in contrast to the religious rituals, what the Lord wants is a people who desire good, who do good, who seek justice, who, who rebuke oppressors, who defend the fatherless and the widows. <clears throat> All those things are spiritual. And, and that's an aspect of spiritual warfare. So, in, you know, in a situation where we're seeking reconciliation for, uh, with, with an individual, with a group of people, whatever, sometimes we need to serve. Sometimes we need to act in, in, in a spirit of compassion, and, and we need to seek justice. We need to call out wrong and oppression and all those things uh, as, as an act of spiritual warfare in, the, in, in conjunction with prayer and, of course, the Word and those types of things, fasting, or whatever else the Lord uh, leads us to do. <clears throat> but it's not just the religious rituals that, that are... There's, you know, there's no magical power in religious rituals. God always looks at the heart, and it's the heart that God is after. And, and in this first key, you know, in order to be ministers of reconciliation, we must recognize who the real enemy is. If our heart is not in the right place in, look, in seeking reconciliation with another person, uh, we're not in the right place. And we can't be a minister of reconciliation even though we do the religious thing or the right religious rituals. So we gotta be very, very, very careful. So being leaders in reconciliation means fighting, means fighting against the real enemy and going to war for other people, not with other people. And, and again, there's a lot of different ways uh, that the Lord may lead us to do that. And we need wisdom in these unique situations. Prayer, seeking justice, fighting oppression, loving our neighbor. I mean, ultimately, it comes down to that. Do I love my neighbor? Uh, do I love this person, even though we're in conflict, in a way that I'm willing to serve, uh, in a way that I'm willing to have compassion? So that's, that's number one. So let's look at number two. Uh, number two, in the context of the three keys uh, of kingdom worldview, kingdom reconciliation is initiated by those whose hearts are right with God. Now, this seems self-evident, if you will, but uh, in, in contrast to the political worldview, <clears throat> the political worldview sees compromise as a tactic of our enemy to get us to buy into their lies. Now, <clears throat> you may not really think, you know, initiating reconciliation and being right with God and compromise in the same area, but let me, let me bring those two together real quick. See, in the political worldview, Compromise also includes just listening to somebody else. Somebody who has a political worldview does not want to listen to somebody they disagree with. And they certainly don't want to listen to understand. Uh, a person with a political worldview does not treat other people with respect. They don't treat them with compassion. Uh, they dismiss the other person's pain or their experience uh, because it, it doesn't fit with their ideology. 
so when, when I say compromise, I'm including all those aspects in here. <clears throat> now, the kingdom worldview is just the opposite. You know, Jesus is a perfect example of that, uh, obviously. But let me, let me make it specific here. You know, it says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that yet while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus compromised. How did he compromise? He knew that we could not reconcile ourselves to God in and of ourselves. There was no way we could do that. Uh, sin prevented us from being reconciled to God. There had to be some sort of, of mediator. There had to be some sort of sacrifice. Well, Jesus was willing to give up his position in heaven. Uh, you know, Paul says of, of Jesus that um, he humbled himself to the point of death, even, even death as a servant. Jesus gave up his glory to be made in the likeness of, of flesh, of, of a man. That is a, a level of humility and humiliation we can't even begin to approach. <clears throat> and we call that the incarnation, where Jesus moved into the neighborhood, if you will. He, he became a man and related to us where we were. That is an act of compromise. Uh, the political worldview says, you need to come to me, to my position, in order for us to be reconciled. Now, if that were the case with God, we wouldn't be having this conversation because we'd all be toast uh, because there's no way we could come to God. There's no way we can come to his position because sin prevented us from that. So what did God do? God came to us. God crossed the divide. Not only did he come to us, not only did he cross the divide, he became the, the means by which we could be reconciled. He was willing to sacrifice for us. Uh, the political worldview will not allow a sacrifice. Uh, it won't even allow listening, let alone a sacrifice. Um, if we're going to be leaders in reconciliation, first of all, we gotta be right with God in the sense of uh, salvation, that's a given, okay? But we have to make sure that we have the right heart. You know, we talked about this a minute ago in number one. But the right heart is, is a manifestation of the heart of God. And God is an initiator. He's the one who initiated reconciliation with us. In the political worldview, we want the other person to initiate reconciliation with us. We want the other person to make all the sacrifices. We want them to change their mind. Now, I'm not saying we have to compromise our values or anything like that. That's not what I'm saying. Because Jesus certainly didn't compromise his values when he came to earth and made him, uh, uh, became a man. But he made a sacrifice. And he compromised. And he incarnated himself in a way that humiliated him in a context of being humbled as a servant. But he didn't view that as a negative because it was his heart so much to reconcile those who were separated from him that he was willing to do it. See, a heart that is right with God desires reconciliation so much that we're willing to make the first step. We're willing to make the initiation and we're willing to, to compromise in the sense of we take the first step. We sometimes have to humble ourselves. We take a, a move in a way that we meet people where they are. But we have to have the right heart. See, if... If we don't have that right heart, uh, you know, Jesus said in, in Matthew 12 that 
Out of the abundance of the heart speaks the mouth. <clears throat> so if our words are contrary to, to our, um, what we say our intention is, um, then we're really betraying or revealing is, is the real aspect. What's really in our heart? Uh, what does that look like? Well, you know, we say as, as Christians that <clears throat> we believe the gospel is the hope of the world, that we believe that, uh, you know, God wants to be reconciled to all people, and that we should, you know, be examples. Yet, you know, we get on Facebook and, and we post these posts or, you know, whatever social media we're on, <clears throat> where we're condemning other people, where we're, we're trying to prove that others are wrong and we're right. Uh, we're, we're using character assassination against other people. That, that is not, that's not a heart that desires reconciliation. <clears throat> that is a heart that is harboring a political worldview. And, you know, even though we're not speaking it, we're typing it, it's the same thing. Uh, you know, out of the abundance of the heart speaks the mouth or types the fingers, if you will. But to be leaders of reconciliation, we have to be reconciled to God ourselves. And we have to be willing to admit to the Lord that, you know, sometimes our heart isn't right. And part of that reconciliation to God is not just salvation. It's not just saying yes to Jesus. <clears throat> It's humbling ourselves before God every day and saying, you know what, Lord, I need you to fix something in here. And we admit that we are broken as well. Um, I think one of, the, one of the things that's missing in reconciliation, especially racial reconciliation, <clears throat> this is something I experienced when I went through Celebrate Recovery. Many years ago, I went through Celebrate Recovery. I was, I'm sort of a product of Celebrate Recovery, if you will. And one of the... the experiences that, that people have in Celebrate Recovery is they'll go into a small group setting. And each small group has uh, what we call guidelines. <clears throat> and one of those guidelines in the small group, <clears throat> excuse me, is we're here to support one another, not fix one another. In other words, I'm not here sitting in this position in this group in a superior uh, place. I'm not here to fix you. I'm here to support you as Jesus fixes you. And not only as Jesus fixes you, but as he fixes me. That I need as much healing as you do. Maybe in a different way. It may be from different things. But at no point in a, in a Celebrate Recovery <clears throat> small group is anyone ever sitting in a position, including the leader, the small group leader, is, is sitting in a position of superiority? <clears throat> the political worldview places us in a position of superiority, saying, I'm fine, I'm fixed. I'm the one in the right. You need to get fixed. Reconciliation cannot happen in that context. We have to be reconciled to God continually. It's not a one-time thing. It's a continual renewal, reconciliation in the sound. I'm not talking about the aspect of salvation. We have to be saved every day. That's not what I'm talking about. I mean, our heart has to be constantly cleansed. Uh, our motives have to be constantly cleansed. Our minds have to constantly be being renewed. It's, it's the process of sanctification. Uh, what Paul talks about, the working out of the salvation that God has put in. And that's a lifelong process. It never ends. Um, even though, I, you know, I've left Celebrate Recovery many years ago, I'm certainly not in any superior position than somebody who's in Celebrate Recovery today by any stretch of the imagination. I still need reconciliation with God. I still need healing in my heart. I still need renewing of my mind. So when it comes to me working with, with other people, uh, in the context of reconciliation or being involved in racial reconciliation, there is no way I can go into that, that, that uh, um, relationship or environment with any ounce of superiority. I, I have no right to that whatsoever. 
<clears throat> I go in saying, you know what? I don't know. I Maybe there's things in me that still need to be healed. I'm sure there are. Uh, and I want to partner with you in a way that we position ourselves for Jesus to heal both of us. Because that's, that's where racial reconciliation will come from. That's where re reconciliation in general comes from. So to be leaders in reconciliation, we must be reconciled to God ourselves. Then we can share with others what we've experienced. And that's the power of Jesus. Uh, I, I, I've got nothing, I don't bring anything to the table when it comes to, to reconciliation or racial reconciliation other than my own experience with Jesus, knowing that Jesus is the healer, that Jesus is the reconciler. And the way I become a minister of reconciliation is by sharing Jesus and sharing my experience with Jesus and, and the wisdom of Jesus and the heart and service of Jesus in seeking justice and compassion and, and, and um, being to others what Jesus has been to me. So that's, that's number two, um, that we are to be initiators of reconciliation by being reconciled to God. So let's look at number three. Uh, number three here is the kingdom worldview teaches that true victory comes when we're reconciled to God and each other. Now, this is in direct contrast to the, the political worldview, which, which promotes the belief that winning only comes through the defeat of our enemies. And as I, as I said last week, <clears throat> one of the tactics that the political worldview teaches that is a viable strategy is character assassination. We see that all the time. In, I mean, that's, that's a modus operandi for the political worldview. And unfortunately, again, it has infected the, the church where we have uh, church leaders and Christians. I mean, they're just assassinating people's character left and right. And that is completely antithetical to the gospel. Um, this is certainly part of the aspect of the, the political worldview of who the enemy is, because in the political worldview, other people are our enemy. And the only way we win is by defeating other people. Uh, and again, that's a lie. And it only focuses on the natural. You know, I use that example of, of Jericho. Uh, you know, if Israel went and tried just to beat down the walls of Jericho in the natural, it wouldn't have worked. Uh, we would not be having this conversation about Jericho today. Uh, the, the victory would not have occurred. It had to occur in the spiritual first. So true victory comes when we defeat our real enemy. Now, of course, Jesus has already defeated our enemy. <clears throat> but we enforce that victory. And we do that, as I mentioned earlier, through whatever ways the Lord gives us wisdom in. But we have to be reconciled to God, and we also have to be reconciled to each other. Here's the greatest way to defeat the enemy. If I'm in conflict with somebody, and we need to be reconciled, the way the enemy is defeated is when reconciliation occurs. When, when reconciliation occurs. When, when we come back together and are united through reconciliation in relationship. That's how the enemy is defeated. It's not by defeating this person. And that's one of the greatest deceptions of the political worldview is it distracts us from the real victory. Real victory is reconciliation. That is victory. And that's what defeats the enemy because that brings us together as one. Uh, there's power in unity. And we see this in Psalm 133, uh, that famous psalm, how, how, how blessed and great is it for those who live together in unity. There, there's an interesting um, verse in, in the book of Genesis. Uh, it's actually in the story of uh, the Tower of Babel, uh, which is kind of, you know, you think the Tower of Babel, it's really weird to bring up because uh, that scattered people and divided people. But there's a really interesting verse in that whole story uh, of the Tower of Babel that speaks of unity. Uh, and it's in verse 6. So if you're familiar with the story of Babel, you know, all these people came together and they started building this tower. They wanted to build it up to heaven uh, and, and exalt themselves. Well, the Lord comes down and looks at the tower 
And he says this in, in verse 6. It's uh, Genesis chapter 11, verse 6. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they purpose to do will be withheld from them. Wow, what a powerful statement. Here is a world that has come together for, for an evil intent to exalt themselves and build a, you know, a tower to themselves. But even God recognizes that the unity of the people will bring about the, the accomplishment of what they want to do. So what does God do? He divides them through confusing their language and they obviously they can't accomplish their goal. But that really speaks to the power of unity and what happens when is when a, a group of people or a church is unified, moving in one direction with one purpose led by the one spirit, that is the greatest thing the enemy fears is a unified church, is a unified people. And that's why he works so hard to divide. <clears throat> and that's what the political worldview does. It divides people, it divides us. But if we, as the people of God, adopt a kingdom worldview, we can enforce the victory of Calvary, the victory of the gospel, the victory of Jesus, to bring unity to people, to bring unity to groups of people. And when that happens, boy, oh boy, do we storm the gates of hell. That is what would, would transform communities all across this country led by the church. So to be leaders in reconciliation, we have to unify and not divide. And when we unify, we have to realize that there's only one enemy. He's defeated by Jesus. And we as the people of God must enforce that victory by defeating him, not other people, not other groups of people. So it's really important to understand that in the context of the kingdom worldview. So as I, as I come to a close here, you know, um, our country again is, is so dependent or so such desperate need for, for leadership. And we're so dependent on the kingdom worldview, I mean the uh, political worldview. Uh, and unfortunately that worldview has infected the church. There is such a need for kingdom leadership right now. And this is such an opportunity for the church to shine. You know, it's, it's in the darkest moments that the smallest light becomes visible. Um, and, and boy, it's things, are things dark in this country right now? And, you know, we don't need 10 bazillion people. We just need a, a committed group of people who are reconciled to God, who have a kingdom worldview, are willing to unite around the gospel and be ministers of reconciliation in this world. And I'm telling you, there's no stopping it. There's no stopping us. There's no stopping God's plan from coming about. So we have to adopt that kingdom worldview. And those three keys, so let me just recap these three keys of the kingdom worldview in the context of, of reconciliation. In order to be ministers of reconciliation, we must recognize who the real enemy is. That's number one. Number two, kingdom reconciliation is initiated by those whose hearts are right with God. And then number three, the kingdom worldview teaches that true victory comes when we are reconciled to God and each other. We, we, we've got to have this kingdom worldview. Because uh, without it, the political worldview is going to lead us to destruction. Hey, it already is. I mean, look at <laughs> look what's going on right now. Just turn on the news for five minutes. The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, uh, not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Well, we are being conformed when we adopt the political worldview. We have to be transformed in order to adopt the kingdom worldview. And the way to do that is through the renewing of our mind. So how do we renew our mind? Well, it's, it, it's very simple. 
Uh, Jesus said in John uh, 15 and 5 that <clears throat> I am the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So how do we abide in Jesus? Well, we abide in Jesus by spending time in his word every day. And one of the things we promote here at Turning Point Church is that everybody should be on a one-year reading plan, a one-year Bible reading plan. I've been doing that for years. Pastor Jeff has been doing that for, for years. Uh, and if you're not doing that, uh, man, I encourage you, start today. Uh, you have to be in the Word of God every single day in order to experience the renewing of your mind. See, the renewing of your mind is not just what you think, it's how you think. It's a change in perspective. Uh, and only Jesus can do that. And he, he does that through his word and through prayer. So you need to be in the word of God every day and spending time with Jesus in prayer every day. And when that happens, you are abiding in Christ. And when you abide in Christ, you bear much fruit. Well, well, what's the fruit? It's the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And that fruit is what leads to the manifestation of the kingdom worldview in your life. And when you are transformed with the kingdom worldview by abiding in Jesus, then your family can be transformed. And then your church can be transformed. And then your community can be transformed, which will lead to the transformation of your city and your state and our country. And that's how it happens, one person at a time being willing to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, abiding in Jesus. If we do that, we can see this ripple effect of the kingdom worldview transforming our communities, our city, our state, and our country. So I just want to challenge you, if, if you really want to let go of the political worldview, if you really want to adopt the kingdom worldview, you need to be abiding in Jesus. So I want to pray for you right now. Um, you know, maybe that's a point of, of reconciliation you need with God right now, is to admit, you know what, I, I've just not been abiding in you. And, and just confess that and ask the Lord to help you and start today uh, abiding in Jesus. So, so let me pray and then, then we'll, we will close. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I thank you for, for your word. I thank you for the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ that is the power of God unto salvation. Lord, I pray for each and every person who, who hears this message. Lord, I pray, <clears throat> Father, if, if they have the political worldview, Lord, you would just bring to their mind recognition of this, Lord, that they would confess that. And Lord, you would help them in walking in repentance by walking in the kingdom worldview. Uh, and Lord, for those that, that are not abiding in you, Lord, that, that are not spending daily time with you in your word and in prayer, Lord. I pray right now, Lord, you would just give them that desire. You would encourage them for that. Lord, they would make that commitment right now uh, so that they can be uh, transformed by the renewing of their mind so that they would know what is that good, perfect, and pleasing will of God. And Lord, I thank you for doing it. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, right after our service tonight, uh, we're going to have a very special time of, of uh, sort of a virtual altar ministry where you can be prayed for live online. Uh, you, can, you can find more information about this immediately following uh, this message on how to connect with us online so we can pray with you and for you. Uh, we love you. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, and I hope this message, this, this series, has, has given you some insight and, and encouragement uh, in, in the area of reconciliation, in ra racial reconciliation. And, and I hope it, it um, builds in you that desire to be a minister of reconciliation so that we can see multitudes of people healed, saved, and delivered in Jesus' name. Amen. And now we want to give you the opportunity to connect with us live online for a time of prayer. If you'd like to join one of our prayer counselors to pray with you, go to tpcfamily.org slash care, that's C-A-R-E, to learn how to connect with us in prayer. 
You can also connect with us online on our website at tpcfamily.org. Go to the Watch Live button, scroll down to the video player, and you will see several options next to the player. There, you can connect with us, submit a prayer request, or share with us that you just received Jesus and salvation. You can also call us directly by calling 817-293-3111. And again, thank you for tuning in, and we look forward to seeing you again.